it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey everybody and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here and this is episode number 207 of our podcast where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day and we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee roaster in Houston, Texas, bright and early coffee. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? We're brewing hazelnut because it's delicious. Now, if you're not drinking bright and early's hazelnut coffee, you are missing out. Their coffee is so delicious. We have a code. It's CWTCL15. For 15% off a bagged coffee, where should everybody go? Brightandearlycoffee.com. And if you like K-Cups, go over to Amazon and follow them on social media. Are you ready to sip some of this delicious hazelnut coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, Plus, orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly Farms, use the link grubly.co slash coffee. Try it today. Hey all, guess what? NatureWise Harvest Blend has the complete layer feed that's as irresistible as scratch. Tasty sunflower seeds, dried winter peas, and cracked corn are mixed together with all the nutrients your birds need. Learn more at NutrinoWorld.com. It's 80 degrees. It's wrong. (laughs) It's just wrong. I am weird, I guess, because I want it to be 50. Oh, me too. It's way too hot for the sheep. I mean, it's probably nice for the birds that are still molting. It's just way too hot. That's the only one that's benefiting. I have so many girls that are molting Mm -hmm. that I feel like they're benefiting from it being so warm. It will at least make that part of the molt a little easier. That's the only thing, though. My sheep are overheated. I'm overheated, man. Uh, This should be sweater weather. (laughs) I know. I was out there in short sleeves today. I couldn't believe it. Me too. Although I will say I have a lot of stuff growing in the garden, but still. We'll be crying for these days in January and February, but maybe. But right now I'm like, I just want to be snuggly in a sweatshirt, not be hot. Snuggly. Yeah. We have been working hard today. We've had lots of interviews, so many good things to bring you guys mm-hmm. later. We've been on this mic all day. Pretty much. Yeah. We have. We just took a break to put the babies in, and I had to bring some in. Clover almost ran into the house. <laughs> Clover wanted no part of you catching her. <laughs> that took forever. She could get some speed when she wants to. <laughs> she, I mean, she was like... She was going. She was running around the fire pit like it was a hamster wheel. <laughs> I'm like, come on. The funnier thing was you running right behind her. I know. Like, <laughs> I'm not... I'm being insane because I'm doing the same thing she is over and over You guys are just running in circles. It was really... I could have gotten up to help you, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm surprised you I, didn't start recording it on your phone. I wouldn't go that far, but I was enjoying it thoroughly. <laughs> I was like, Clover, <laughs> no. Yeah, so that's been fun. Oh, chasing chickens outside. What's new with you? Really wanting the holidays and I'm wanting coolness with the holidays. I might not get what I want. Sometimes life does that. <laughs> I'm feeling some winter holidays right now. We have a news flash. Uh, I wasn't finished telling them. About people. Our Christmas lights are up. Oh, that is a news flash. <laughs> <laughs> they look good. I mean, I saw them when I pulled up. I was like, wow, look at that. Thanks, honey. They look good. What were you saying now? No, yeah, we just have some fall tasks to complete. What are you going to do? We need to build the darn goose run. <laughs> I know. The geese come out of their shed every morning and they go to the other end of that little field to the, what will be the duck run. Right. So they camp out in the duck run all day. And I mean, they're out with us during the day at various times, but we need their run built. And I brought it up to Pete the other day and he said, oh, we haven't worked out right now. And I'm like, there are ducks coming in the spring. We're going to need that run. (laughs) Come spring, I'm still going to be saying we need to build that goose run. And on that note, (laughs) if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button. For two reasons, you never want to miss an episode, and they count them. 
If you're looking for other ways to help support the show, you can tell a few chicken-loving friends about us. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can check out our Etsy shop. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. And the other thing you can do to help support the show is visit our website and our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! So not sure if anyone has gotten the memo, but we're kind of chicken people. Yeah, we're into chickens. So recommending an omelet igloo coop is a pretty easy gig. Because we're into igloos too. Yep. I've had mine for about six years. I've got to go up, three cubes, and a pro. Oh, so I have an igloo pro. If you don't know igloos, they're green. A dream to clean. Fort Knox for your flocks. If you're into chickens, you need to get into igloo coops. And right now, they're 20% off. Ooh, Black Friday. You know the deal. Oh, I know the deal. Search omelet. That's O-M-L-E-T. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like monthly subscriptions? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then, yeah. Let us take a minute to tell you about chicken love. You get a monthly chicken lady tea, treats for your flock, and a keeper care card. And did you know with every multi-month subscription, you get a free Chicken Love logo t-shirt? Really? Yeah! It's $36 a month with free shipping. What are you waiting for? Get off the nest and click already. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business, working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Yeah, they come out at night. They got big eyes. They see really well at night. They like to eat a lot of little creatures. Yes, it's time for this week's breed spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. And also, they don't shave their beards. Oh, my Lord. (laughs) It's time for the breed spotlight. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's not even a song. That's more like a <laughs> rambling spoken meditation or something. I'm going to go to open mic night with that. Oh, yeah. I'm going to come and see that one. <laughs> Man. This week's breed spotlight is the Dutch Albeard. <laughs> you crack yourself up. <laughs> Look, if you can crack yourself up, you're good because you can always make at least one person laugh. First rule of comedy, you got to please yourself. I mean, like, if you're ever down, you just got to say something. You'll be like, that's funny. I don't, you don't give me time to get down. I don't get to. He just took the mic out. You don't give me rest. You don't give me. (laughs) No. (laughs) Oh, I love you, Holly Ann. Uh Uh, Right back at you. (laughs) You were slow to return on that one. I was trying to take a sip of water. (laughs) That's the excuse. (laughs) Well. This week, <laughs> the Dutch owl beard. They've got a beard, man. The beautiful Dutch owl beard is a very old and rare breed of chicken that was developed in the Netherlands at least 500 years ago, possibly longer. Yes. Are you going to say anything about their beard being super long? Because they're 500 years old. <laughs> You're already thinking like I got it. Yeah. I wasn't even going to say that. I've cracked the code. <laughs> you see, you're laughing. You're like, when you think these things, it makes you laugh. Yeah, oh, it does. It does. You're like, I should have said that, man. The Albeard is a member of that old v and crested family that includes your favorite. The Polish. The Crevcore, La Flesh, the Brabanter, the Breda, etc. The Euro, the La Flesh. Oh, yeah. And some sources even claim that they were a foundation breed for the Polish. I could see that. Yeah. Their name in Dutch is Nederlands Ulibarden. Now, we have looked at this chicken for a long time. They're so beautiful. Oh, I love these chickens. Yeah. I love this bird. This is a gorgeous bird. Like a lot of the old European heritage breeds, though, it is hard to find a lot of history on them from my seat here in the U.S. Well, that's why we're traveling. We've got to go there. Yeah, but I don't speak Dutch, so that's going to make it harder. I do. Oden Naden. Oh, my. <laughs> God, you're going to get us arrested. They're going to be like, we're revoking your passports. 
You're going to prison for abuse of the Dutch language. <laughs> I thought that accent was pretty good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is strictly conjecture, but given the number of Dutch settlers that were here in the U.S. and the fact that the Breda was definitely present here, yeah. I would not be at all surprised to find that the Albeards were around in colonial and early America. They have that colonial look like they could have been around then. <laughs> Stop. I'm oh. definitely tired tonight. Yeah. So I'm okay. like entering that tired phase. Are you slap happy? Because I can slap you. <laughs> make, you happy, make me happy. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> they have been identified in several 16th century paintings in Europe. That makes them both an old breed. And it's possible that that makes them important enough right. to have figured into a painting for whatever reason. We would get painted with our chickens. Right? Draw me like your French girls. <laughs> oh, little you know man. who I would get? Yeah, I was just uh, going to say. Yeah. I would get painted with little man. I know you would. I'd have to put clothes on him, though. He couldn't be naked for the paint. There's naked legs of his <laughs> sticking out. <laughs> this little frog leg. Somebody called him his frog legs. Frog legs, legs yeah. yeah. I checked in with our favorite poultry historian, or at least mine. Lewis Wright. Lewis Wright. And he did not disappoint. He does have, it's just about a paragraph for the Albeard. And judging on their appearance, he connects them to the old Thuringian chicken from Germany. Right. Could be some connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, these breeds are so old. Once they're older than, say, a thousand years old, it's, it's really hard. hard to trace anything. Oh, yeah. I mean, unless you can go back in some sort of, like you said, an archive, a cave. Maybe there's drawings. The cave, there's, there might be drawings of the owl beard itself in the cave. <laughs> that would be an interesting trip. It really would be an interesting trip. I'd be like, look. Redraw it. We Let's can do the UK, but I'm not sure we're making it alive at a continental Europe. <laughs> no, we're we're going to be full can. of offenses and just, <laughs> I think it could go very badly. It's hard to argue that this is a really, really old breed though. That whole family, you know, they have the cavernous nostrils, they have the crest, the V-comb, all of that stuff. They are my favorites. I look at them and they just make you happy when you look. I think they're gorgeous. They're fascinating. Yeah. I love the nostrils that are the ones that are like raised up like that. I love your nostrils. <laughs> Little man. Little man. I do think there could be some truth to what Lewis Wright said about their connection to the Thuringian chicken. I think, yeah, I think we, that you found that out before when we were talking about the Albeards. But I don't think this has ever been substantiated with DNA. So you just never know for sure. I did like this, though. Lewis Wright contends that the Albeard hens are capital layers. Okay. Capital layers. That means they're really good. Oh. Okay. Another way of saying super Girl, you need layers. To Brush up on your British isms before we go to London. I know, I do. I do, definitely. London, here we come. Oh Fiona, boy. we're coming to see you. They're going to run or <laughs> buckle up, one of the two. <laughs> the Albeard is a standard size chicken, mm -hmm. which is really good. But they do have bantams as well. Can you imagine this chicken as I a bantam? Yes, I could. They're ridiculously cute, but I don't think you can get the bantams in the U.S. Oh, that's a travesty, man. Okay, so they're remarkable for their beards, their muffs, their small crest, and that visible V-comb. All the things that I love in a chicken. Oh, yeah. Their waddles are practically non-existent, and their earlobes are white and on the small side. Okay, so I love the white earlobes that iridescent. They have like that iridescent glow to them. Mm -hmm. That's how my Polish are. They're really pretty. It's the same way. Okay, so the legs are clean and slate in most colors. Now, the Albeards come in at least 14 different color varieties. That's 14. At least. Now, let's name some of them. We'll start with white. Black. Black laced blue. There is silver and gold spangled. The cuckoo. Yellow white spangled. The silver and gold penciled. Lemon spangled. And the moorhead. Now, the solid colors with the black head. That's the moorhead. Yeah. Yeah, solid colors with black head. They're really pretty. They're beautiful. This takes me back to, was it a year or two ago, we had a listener who was going to send us some, but we just couldn't take any more chicken. Who was that. breeding at the time. Yeah, yeah. And it's like we were we were going back and forth because we were like, we could both see this chicken at in our flock. At some point, I need some Yuli Barden in my life. Yes, now, the roosters are going to weigh in at about six to seven pounds. That's not tiny. No, they're a good size. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're not tiny. They're small to medium, and the hens come in at about five pounds. Yeah. Now, the hens are good layers of large white eggs, and they're going to give you about 200 per year. That's pretty nice. Pretty good. And they're supposed to go broody only occasionally. But they are excellent mothers when they hatch a clutch. One of the things I like about them is they're black beards. Yeah. The black beards are. Uh, yeah, I know you like that. 
I do. They are known to be an active breed, but most reports describe them as tame with people and good in a mixed flock. I mean, if they're anything like their other counterparts, yes, they're all those things. Yeah, I mean, they're active. They need plenty of space to scratch and forage. I mean, they're probably good garden helpers. They're great. And a large run and some supervised free range time should be enough to keep them safe and happy. Yeah. You don't want any of the smart chickens to get too bored and start picking on others. That's when you have picking problems. Right. So you're trying to balance their safety with enough exercise and stimulation. Exactly. Again, they should be great in the garden. They'll help you turn over garden beds and compost piles. And they're definitely cold hardy. Absolutely. Because look, they don't have hardly any comb and waddle. Right. I mean, but the V comb, you do have to protect... But the waddle is almost non-existent. Well, you know, the beard and muff and all of that. And they do tolerate the warm weather. But you still want to make sure they have plenty of cool water and shade because that is extra feathering on them. You know, the best chickens yeah. in the heat are like the ones that don't have a lot of face feathers and lots of nice red skin to give off the heat. Exactly. These guys have virtually no comb. Like they are feather covered. Exactly. So they're going to need some. This one's kind of cute. This I love is that black one of the beard. pictures from that, Green Fire. That's a lemon spangled. Yeah. Now, if you're looking for more information or searching for breeders in Europe, where are they going to go? The Dutch BKU Club. They also have really nice paintings and drawings of vintage birds. Right. I love that site. Google will translate it to English for you. Yeah. Sometimes there's some idioms that you don't understand, but it's enough to. Really, it's if you're interested in these old breeds, that's a great site. The club supports the Brabanter, the Breda, and the Owl Beard. That's the BK and the U. Yes, exactly. Now, here's the thing. Where can we go? We know we can go to Green Fire Farms. Green Fire Farms does have them available. Now, the last time we profiled the Owl Beard, they only had one color, the Lemon Spangle. Right. They have since added a second color variety. They now have the Lemon Spangled and the beautiful gold spangled. Here's the problem, though. They're straight run only. Well, yeah. You have to be willing to take a boy. Right, right. But, I mean, that's often the case with these more unusual and older breeds that you're only going to be able to get them straight run. Exactly. Now, if you have the Albeard. Oh, we need to see some Albeard. We need to see some Albeard pictures. So, give us a story on Instagram and hit the mention button and then put our name in and we can reshare the story easily for you. Are you ready to dive into the fascinating world of backyard ducks? Look no further than Metzer Farms, your premier destination for top quality waterfowl. Whether you're a seasoned breeder or just starting out, Metzer Farms has everything you need to elevate your flock to the next level. And if you're passionate about call ducks, you're in for a treat. Metzer Farms hatches a stunning variety of call ducks, meticulously bred for their miniature size, beauty, and calm temperament. From snowy whites to vibrant colors, each duck is a masterpiece waiting to grace your backyard. Visit MetzerFarms.com today to browse their extensive selection and start your journey into the wonderful world of waterfowl. Metzer Farms, where passion meets perfection. Hey all, guess what? There's finally a nutritious chicken feed that will have your flock begging for more. NatureWise Harvest Blend is the complete layer feed that's as irresistible as scratch. Tasty sunflower seeds, dried winter peas, cracked corn, and Aztec marigold meal for golden yolks are mixed together with an aromatic blend of essential oils that will keep your girls laying. NatureWise Harvest Blend also has pre, pro, and postbiotics for digestion, plus plenty of protein for beautiful feathers. Learn more at NutrinaWorld.com. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. They're back with an innovative new product. You're going to want to check this out. It's an extra large set, a 14-pound feeder and three-gallon water with steep anti-roost lids. They're made of super durable material. You can either stand them on legs or hang them on brackets on your coop or fence. They're easy to remove and clean too. Plus, they look awesome. We personally use Roosties and we're huge fans. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, check out the Roosties store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. 
Okay, so are we ready to move on to main topic? Yeah. 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 So this week, we actually do have a surprise guest. Surprise! And we are super thrilled. We have Janelle Anderson with us. You might know Janelle from the Haven Farmstead. If you were at Murray Fest, you definitely saw Janelle. Welcome to the show. We are so happy to have you here with us. Oh, thank you both. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome to the table. We were so happy to meet you in Iowa. And you were the lady who was walking around talking about cows to everybody and then <laughs> stopped by our tent and said, okay, I'm going to come in your tent and talk about cows too. We're like, please do. <laughs> if I can talk to anybody about cows, I will until I'm blue in the face. That's my favorite topic. Fantastic. That's great. Cows are lots of fun, but do you also know what's a lot of fun? Chickens. Chickens are fun. We love cow. Well, I don't think we've ever met any livestock we didn't love. We love all animals. We really do. And you are passionate about dairy cows. I mean, that's your area of expertise. I've seen you wax poetic about milking. It's amazing. What you do is fantastic. So what we're going to talk with you about today is some of the larger things that we're seeing in farming and homesteading. Among them, we're going to talk about legacy, leaving the land for your children, leaving the land a certain way. Teaching the skills. Mm. Teaching skills, passing knowledge, and also how to figure out what animals are appropriate for your property. What works best for you? You want to start a homestead, a farmstead? What is right? Right. You know, like, where do you start, chickens? Where do you start, <laughs> chickens? I'm sure that it's been said a million times, but ch <laughs> chickens are truly the gateway drug. <laughs> or wait, we shouldn't say drug. They are the gateway animal. It's, Some it's, say drug, too. <laughs> Maybe my husband would probably say drug. <laughs> so I, I want to start this by just, I want you to tell our listeners all about you and your family and your farmstead and all your uh, okay, so this is actually my favorite subject is my family. Uh, my husband and I, Ben, we live in southern middle Tennessee with three of our four kids. Our fourth kid is away at college back in North Dakota, which is actually where we moved from before we moved to middle Tennessee. We're in western North Dakota. We ranched. So we were cattle ranchers out there. It had The ranch had been in my husband's family for over 100 years. Talk about legacy. There is that in that. But I grew up in Wisconsin. And I am a rural girl, country girl. I guess the homesteading movement of today, that's kind of what we did, but we never called it that. We just lived rural. We were country people. I'm so grateful for how I grew up because my parents gave us such an opportunity that is truly serving us well now. But in Tennessee, we not only have milk cows and beef cows as well, as well as chickens. Chickens, I should have said first, because those were the first things that we got when we got here. <laughs> But we also raised like whole chickens, pasture raised and like meat birds, as well as turkeys. They're all raised on the pastures. All of our animals are. And we are very, very passionate about bringing clean food to our community and teaching how to actually do that themselves. You're awesome at it. We witnessed it. And oh. <laughs> you are a great educator to help people. It's so necessary. It's so empowering for people to have their own food sources. And we talk all the time about that disconnect. So just, just being able to offer resources for people to learn from is very powerful. I like this too, that it's now turning into a women thing, a woman thing. We're strong. We can do all of these things. Stop being afraid of this stuff. We can do it. We can. I agree. Like I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I have a daughter. We only have one daughter out of the four kids. The rest are boys. And she not only can bake and cook because she's amazing at it. She's 16 and she does that better than I do. Uh, but she also, I also want her to know how to do the things outside because again, it's about skills, like a skills across the board. Like all of my kids need to learn how to do all of the things so that if they ever need it, they will be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that is about that legacy. I feel like in my family, with my mom's family, her grandparents were immigrants from Italy over here. And my great grandfather was an egg farmer. And he had lots and lots of land and hundreds of leghorns and Rhode Island reds and supplied eggs for Baltimore City and little Italy of Baltimore City. And that legacy, I feel like sometimes it gets in your blood. It's get my mom and her generation. But then for me, then I have that need to go out and do that. And I feel like sometimes that legacy, you just get it via your genetics. 
Mm -hmm. And I think what's really cool about what you just said is you have that to look back on and it's really cool and you get to talk about it and you get to share that experience with people who didn't have that legacy. And so like what you guys are doing, you know, in, in all of the amazing, you guys are so funny. Like, just so you guys know, I enjoy sitting and talking with you all the time about anything, but you not only have that, but you also are bringing education to people on whatever scale they need. And I love that so much. And I think you're filling a gap of, for the people who didn't have that legacy in the past. Well, thank you. I, we, we, tr- we are absolutely trying. That we're is trying. what we're trying to do. And amazing women like you that we have the farming connection with, we all work together in getting the news out there and helping people do the same things we're doing. I just want to say thanks to my mom mm. because she, you know, I started baking when I was about eight and she didn't stop me. And she taught us those things like you take care of the animals first, then you, you you do all of the other things. And just a big thank you to her because I would say that we we were homesteading, but we didn't call it that. It didn't have a name. It's just what we did. Mm-hmm. And you spent enough time around the animals. You learned tons too. Yeah, I was always at Holly's farm. homestead farm doing the stuff with her. You know. The- okay, so we're heading back and we're heading back to resources and we're heading back to Family, you have these amazing kids who have learned a ton of stuff. What do you think, if you were tasked with coming up with some resources for learning for, say, older kids or people who are young couples who want to start on a homesteading journey, what are some resources you think are important for them? Even if you don't think you want to homestead on a great scale of maybe you you don't think you'll ever get into cattle, but Mm -hmm. you still want to do something. You still want to raise some of your food, whether it's growing it or it actually is some protein and stuff like that. I think it's great to find out where the conferences are. I would never have said that before the last couple of years, but now that I've been able to attend some, there is nothing like sitting in there under people who have experience and getting that from them. And so that's first and foremost most. Actually, that's not first. That's second. First is finding mentors. There are people everywhere. You just don't know they're there that want to share with you what they're doing, why they're doing it. And they're going to take you under their wing to do this kind of stuff. And then of course, uh, after that, it's seeking out education, whether it's books and resources like that. It's listening to podcasts. I actually, I'm going to tell the truth. I don't like podcasts (laughs) until the I know, I know, I know you guys are going to be like, why did we invite this girl? No. Until someone really pushed me and they sent me a few podcasts on cattle and he's like, you really need to listen to these. And I was like, okay, fine. I respect you enough. I'll listen to them. And I realized that if I can listen to them at two times the speed, <laughs> that I I can do this. And I have gleaned so much great information. And so I think finding people who you believe that you would value what they have to tell you, that's a great resource also. Yeah. And then social so media. True. Let's talk about social media. It yeah. gets such a bad rap, but there are people out there who are giving freely of their education. Now, I'm not saying that if they offer something that's paid that that it's not worth it because it right. truly is and can be. But man, there's so many people who just have a heart to share with others what they're doing. And I think that's incredible. So it can be so bad in so many different ways, but man, it can also be a great resource. I want to go yeah. back to mentors because we all hung out like a few, two, three weeks ago at Janet Garman's house. It was you and Ann and us. And we had such an amazing day of just talking, drinking coffee, having fun with the animals, doing all that great stuff. And I think building that community Mm. with like minds is so important and having those mentors and women doing that for other women is amazing. And with that, you guys inviting me on here, you just opened the world up to people who are maybe wanting a family milk cow in the future or deciding if it's even right for them or beef cattle. So now they know a person, which is myself and my husband, that could possibly mentor them or help them get more information and make that decision going forward if it's right for them. So how long have you been in Tennessee? We moved to our place in 2022. So September 15th of 2022, we hit our property and we actually purchased raw land. And so, so we flew down here in April of 2022. We put flags in the ground for the house builder and for the garage. And we did not come back until September. So everything 
I'll take credit. I was the general contractor through email, through phone calls and stuff like that. But everything was done through that kind of communication. Mm. And we had no water when we got here. We didn't have a well drilled. That's, I'm going to tell you, don't do that. That was really stupid. That's hard. We'll we'll, we'll just admit that. It turned out well in a way. (laughs) It's fine. (laughs) But we started on raw land. The place that we live on was nothing before we came here except for a field and trees. So what's your acreage? How many acres are you? Uh, we are just a little under 45 acres. Nice. And not, not all of it is usable. We have plans to clear out a little bit under the trees. We don't want to take out the trees that we have, but we have lots of pasture area. That's why my husband liked this property. He's from North Dakota, Western North Dakota. There's like barely any trees. And so when right. he saw this place, he was like, oh, I can see potential with this. I don't feel claustrophobic. So what, okay, list your animals that you have on your farm for us. Okay, okay. so we have two family milk cows, secret. We might be looking at getting a third. We don't know for sure. We'll Just, keep it a secret. Shh. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have layer chickens. We also have meat birds, like whole chickens that we process for ourselves and then for other customers. We have turkeys. We have beef cattle. We do pigs. In different seasons, we don't actually grow them or or raise them ourselves. We usually Mm -hmm. take feeder pigs in and we finish them. And I think that's it. Kids, feral kids, do they count? Do you grow any crops (laughs) or veggies or herbs or... Yeah. So we have a a big garden. It's like 4,000 plus square feet. It's Mm. maybe closer to 4,500 square feet, which we never garden until we moved to Tennessee. So that this is, that was our second year was this year. And it's always a learning curve. And we will always tell people you can learn what not to do from us in gardening. We cannot teach you what to do. (laughs) Are some of the kids into something more than others? So do you have somebody that's like going into the gardening versus the animals or... So I usually take care of the garden. My mom moved in with us. She's widowed. My dad passed away the end of 2021. So she moved in with us last Thanksgiving, almost a year. And she will help me in the garden a bit. She's busy. She's got her own things. So garden is normally mine. My son takes care of a lot of the chickens and the meat birds. He usually Mm -hmm. moves them every day, feeds and waters them for us. And my husband and I share duty between milking the cows and the beef cattle. And then my daughter, she really does a lot of the stuff in the house because she likes that. Being with the animals, she's very skilled and knows what she's doing, but she prefers to be in the house doing different things. She will always be like, when we're ready to process a round of meat birds, she'll be like, you guys want lasagna for supper and like a triple berry chocolate who does she Ganache sound like? Covered right? cake, and I'm like, yes, yes, we do. You don't need to process chickens with. Us. Okay, she sounds exactly like Ella, my 14, about to be 15 year old. I think we need to have these two meet. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> How did you figure out what animals were the right ones for your place? We knew right away that chickens were. I mean, we had them back in North Dakota. I had them growing up. And so I was very familiar with them. Actually, we had every animal that we have down here growing up. I did. Minus we didn't have family milk cows. But we lived in Wisconsin. And we got our milk from a local dairy and things like that. So it was part of like our culture. It just wasn't something we brought home. And when we were like figuring out and deciding when and what to bring home here, we had to be like really really honest with ourselves about what our skill levels were first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Did we think that we could bring a family milk cow home and take care of it down here? Well, the answer was yes, because we had one back in North Dakota that wasn't new to us. And then the second question was, do we have the infrastructure in place for whatever livestock animal that we were talking about? And infrastructure is really the first thing that people should work on. When we first moved to Tennessee, I wanted a milk cow here like that because I missed our girl, we didn't bring her any of our animals with us, minus no. our dogs. <laughs> that's that's the only animals we did. And I wanted a milk cow here so badly, but my husband rightfully so said, we need to make sure that we have stuff in place before we do it. And so we worked our tails off, not only finishing the inside of our house, at least to a livable state. We don't have trim up <laughs> still in our house. That's okay. <laughs> it is. It's fine. But we then turned our, our sights to outside because part of what we wanted to do down here was to grow and raise our own food. Mm-hmm. And to do that, we needed to put some infrastructure in place. So nobody wants to haul water. 
That's like the first thing that I can tell you is that I, I you agree. do not want to haul water. I, nope. I'm not saying that like five, 10 feet to your chickens if you can, and you can usually put a hose on it. But milk cows or cows in general, they can drink 30 plus gallons a day. Who's going to haul 30 plus gallons a day for one animal? That's something no, to think about times, for sure. It, having grown up with horses in the 80s, I absolutely appreciate the vagaries of animal care in winter. It's tremendously difficult. It absolutely is. And coming from Western North Dakota and even Wisconsin, Western North Dakota, (laughs) negative 50, it got to that sometime. I'm not saying it stayed there, but with the wind chill, that happens sometimes. And so with that, you always had to plan ahead. We were milking our milk cow in negative 30 degree temperatures in a barn that did have sides, but the eaves were open. So it's not like it was, maybe it was negative 15 then. (gasps) That's so cool, man. (laughs) Okay. So yeah. When you milk, can you wear something like fingerless gloves or do you have to have bare hands to milk? Fingerless gloves wouldn't work because usually you're using your whole hand, whole fist. but you could put on, some people actually use like rubber gloves, like BPA free mm-hmm. kitchen gloves, food grade gloves, and that's what they'll milk with too. So you can provide a little bit of barrier. We even milking in that cold of a temperature, we just had a little heater that we mounted on the side that gave us enough heat. And when you're snuggled up next to that cow and you're milking, you don't really get cold. It's yeah. like the most beautiful feeling. And I don't want to idealize it like thinking it's just this amazing experience because it can be really hard. But that moment right there, nothing beats it. I've seen photos of you milking and you look so joyful and content and at peace all at the same time. And that's why it's beautiful. That's why we want to do this stuff. We want that feeling yeah. that you get so that when all the other stuff comes around, the health problems or the problems with the structures, you're able to handle that and go on because in your heart, your heart is full from what you're doing. Mm. And without that, you would lose your mind. If your heart wasn't full and you weren't all in, you would yeah. lose your mind. Yep. So it's so important. And then having the kids and handing that over to them is important. I would like to ask what advice you have for folks who are starting out and they know they're never going to be able to have, say, dairy cows because they're probably always going to live maybe in a townhouse with half an acre. What advice do you have for them? This is actually one of my favorite things because not everybody is called to farm, to homestead, to raise animals, to raise your own food even. I think the best thing that you can do is find someone who's doing it if that's not for you. I always think of like some of my favorite people who live in the middle of town, have no backyard. And I'm not saying there's not things you can do because you can. You can grow in your windowsill. You can grow a small garden in a little container. I have friends who have done that and have done it successfully and backyard chickens. You guys talk about that all the time. There are possibilities out there, but don't overlook that there's people like myself who will do the things for you. We're just asking you to compensate us fairly for yeah, doing those yes. things. There's people out there who are raising food that is nutrient dense food that want to share it with you beyond what their family is using. And that's the way we are. Like, we're not looking to raise, I mean, we used to up to 200 head of cattle. That's, that's about what we had back in North Dakota. Mm. Right now we have six girls. We were around 12 and we had some different things that we were shifting through and changing, but I don't want hundreds of heads of cattle. Like I want enough to feed my family and then just do more that makes sense. and can be a good business model without being to the scale that we were before. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing that it's part of your experience because it does take skill, it does take knowledge, it takes all those things to know when you're at a point where, okay, I'm at a stopping point. I don't want to add 50 more chickens to myself. Like I'm kind of there this year. I'm kind of at a point where I'm like, okay, I've had some health problems. So I'm dealing with those. The chickens go to the vets, they get taken care of. But I'm at a point now where I'm going to deal with the flocks that I have the 20 something, almost 30 chickens that I have. And then, like you said, you just deal with what you have and you you say, okay, I'm going to stop for at least a year. The value of figuring out what works for you and what you might want to get elsewhere is huge. Like, yeah. We grew hay for a while. Uh-uh. I have a wonderful woman, she and her husband, they actually do beef and they do hay and I will buy from her. She will bring me deliveries every 60 days. I am not growing hay. I'm happy to pay a really fair and generous price for a good product. My sheep eat a lot of hay. 
Mm. So, I mean, wool sheep tend to need a little better nutrition than sheep you're raising for mutton or lamb. And I'm happy to pay for it. And you know what? I am so happy that I do not have to bail hay. It's worth it. Well, in a time right now, it's been about, I don't know about you, but our chickens are all molting. So it's been about two plus weeks since I've even gotten an egg from almost 30 chickens. So I do go to the local farm and get other fresh eggs at that point. I'm going to support somebody else that's in it along with me rather than going someplace else and just buying it commercially. I feel like, and you can tell us this because I'm sure you have your finger on this much more than we do, but we've seen the rise of the small farm dairy. I mean, there are two or three of them between my county and yours right now where you can go to buy fresh milk, Mm -hmm. fresh ice cream. Feed the babies. It's so cute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you seen a lot of that happening? And do you feel like most areas have a resource like that? I think we've seen a resurgence in the family milk cow, for sure. I don't think it ever died away, but I think they kind of kept to themselves for just reasons. There was kind of an attack on milk as a whole. And and if we're talking about raw milk, and I encourage everybody to go do their research and and come to the conclusion that they feel about it. I'm not here to make someone feel one way or another. We do drink raw milk on our farm from our girls, and we choose that for many reasons. But so, yes, I think there's been a resurgence of people wanting to not only have access to clean foods, but to get back to natural whole foods Mm -hmm. that are done in a way that is safe and healthy and that the concern is for the overall condition and health of the animal, which is going to, in return, produce a really nutrient dense product. We say that all the time, but it is really important. And so that's really cool to see this resurgence of it. And I do see it. I see people who get a cow also. And they're like, I can't wait to use all of this. And then that cow is producing five gallons a day. And they were like, what do I do with five gallons a day? Oh, oh, my friend is asking me if they can have some milk. So yeah, then they get into that game of supplying it. And I'm 100% okay with it. I think it's such a beautiful thing It is that, that we can go within our communities and have access to all of this beautiful food. And that maybe even 10 years ago, it kind of felt not available to us. Yeah. I get joy from giving my eggs to people that the kids will have a pediatrician appointment and I'll take a dozen eggs. Like our doctor's so used (laughs) to getting eggs. She's like, oh, you brought me eggs or the dentist. Or uh, it's so funny. Somebody came, I had a flat tire. So AAA came, they went away with a dozen eggs because it was (laughs) egg season. So it gives me joy to spread that to people. And that's like you said, it's the, the community and knowing okay, maybe you can't have these animals, but you can support the people that do. Mm -hmm. So look within your community, even look on social media to find who's out there. Even if it's a product that you just don't like growing. I hate, okay, my house- Hate is a very strong word. Oh, I'm not finished. (laughs) Not finished. You should say strongly dislike. No. Yes. If you're going to say okra, then yes, I hate okra. Oh, wait. I was not. I was going to say- (laughs) I was going to say Brussels sprouts. No, in my house, we eat a lot, a lot of crucifers and a lot of broccoli and cauliflower. I hate growing it. Mm. The beetles get to it. It's just, it's a giant pain. Oh, the squirrels get to all your stuff. No, that's why I plant so much. They get to (laughs) some of my stuff. I will happily pay someone else. I'll give them yarn if they will keep me supplied with broccoli and cauliflower because it's such a pain for me to grow. Mm Mm-hmm. So we have two last questions for you. The first is, where do you see the future of the farmstead? So our farmstead or as a yes, whole? Yours. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, yours. Yeah, see. <laughs> What's the future look like for you? So my husband and I are very heavily right now planning for 2025. And one of the things that we are doing is working on expanding our workshops. We really have such a passion for people and we want people to come figure out the things that they don't know, even to realize if it's not for them, it it could be chickens or maybe it is family milk cows or beef cows or pigs or whatever it may be. The garden, they'll come and look at my garden. They'll be like, yep, see, I can't do any better than her. (laughs) I'm just kidding. We do that to to visit you. Yeah, we do that. In Tennessee. We do that to make people feel better. They look at our garden. They're like, oh, they don't do everything well. <laughs> 
But with that, we're expanding what we're going to offer for 2025, and we're getting really close to release the list. And why I say this is, again, I don't think everybody is going to do everything that we are doing, but I also love what I call back pocket knowledge. I want to teach people skills and knowledge that maybe they will never use, but if they ever have to or want to, they've already accumulated that knowledge. And one of the things that I think about a lot is there are things now that I'm like, how do I know how to do this? Have you guys ever had that oh, yeah. thought? All the time. So I, I heard it explained oh, one yeah. time is that they they just, they didn't know where it came from until they realized that it, it came because they watched someone, let's say, growing up do this. Yeah. Right. And, or it was explained to them, it was modeled for them, whatever it is, the good and the bad. But with that, There are so many things that I gained knowledge on that is serving us so well because my parents modeled it for me in creating the life that they did. And that's like the legacy of it. And so we want to help people create legacy within their families so that maybe they'll never use it. But guess what? Maybe their grandkids are, but they're going to teach them and, and so that it's there for them to pull from if needed. I feel like you're talking directly to me with this. (laughs) I mean, my great grandfather being the egg farmer and then. Yes, I feel like that. That's so important. I'm always like, where did I get this love of chickens? And meanwhile, my great grandfather had hundreds. So let's go into the last question. The last question. So we're going to make it a little special for you. We ask all of our guests this question. And that is, what is your favorite breed of chicken? Ooh. Then for you, they're going to be another question. Okay. So my favorite breed of chicken right now is, this is like so basic, but they're amber stars. From okay, okay. hatchery. And the reason is, is man, they are prolific layers. They're smaller and they produce so many eggs and they like don't eat as much food because they're smaller than like some of our bigger birds that we have. And I love that because we think all the time about inputs and what we're, the cost is in raising these, these eggs for ourselves. And so I'm really in love with that one. I do love Black Copper Morans, and I do love Lavender Orpingtons. Oh, yeah. What's the personality like of the Amber Stars? Are they really friendly? No. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, maybe for some people, but not for us. They'll be by us, but like they don't, they don't want to be. That's why I love Kel. She doesn't sugarcoat it, man. (laughs) The house personality is a good, no. No. My (laughs) other question is, one of them selfishly is, I want to know what's the best dairy sheep? But what's your favorite dairy cow? That's two questions. It is. That's oh, not gosh. one more question. I don't care. I got to ask it. <laughs> You're going to kill me on the sheep one. Okay, but I'll start with the dairy. I really love a Jersey. I love her big, beautiful eyes and her eyelashes. We actually have two Jersey girls. They're so um, pretty. They are. I love them so much. They're beautiful. But in a smaller farm homestead setting, I love a crossbreed. So I would love... We're. We're working on crossing jerseys with a beef cattle breed that has some milking backgrounds to maybe make a more suited for homesteads and smaller farms. So it's jerseys for now, but maybe it'll be a different What's combination. What's the breed you're crossing with? Red Pulls. You can look them up on the Livestock Oh, I know what they are. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I was able to give that information. She looked like yeah, a I can. Oh, I talk about them all the time because <laughs> I really have fallen in love with the breed. I think I think there were some great things. And much like a lot of other breeds, they were bred more towards beef production. But we're going to try our best to maybe bring it back a little bit and show a little more stout, stockier frame, a, a yeah. rounder frame in a, in a family milk cow that'll be mm-hmm. a little bit easier to keep just on grass. Nice. I think we have our resident cow expert. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. If anybody has questions, we have Janelle. And what's your recommendation for a dairy sheep? If you have one, if you don't, no worries. So (laughs) I'm just going to give a shout out to my friend, Rachel Hester. She has a book on dairy sheep and it's really excellent. Okay. With With that said, I am not a dairy sheep connoisseur. And so I believe that I've heard her talk about East Frisians. East Frisians, yeah. Okay. So with that, I'm going to say it's that one because it's the only one that comes to mind. Oh man, this was so much fun catching up. We always have so much fun starting with when we walked in the hotel in Iowa, Janelle was the first beautiful face that greeted us and told us where to go for dinner. Food. Where's the food, uh, Janelle? Point, point us to the food. Yep. Point us to the food, please. Happy, happy to point people to food anytime, as long as they're taking me with. So, yeah. Okay. So thank you so much for coming on. We're going to have to have you back on to talk about more stuff. Uh, Very quickly, where can our listeners find you? 
Yeah. So our website is thehavenfarmstead.com. They can also find me on social media on Instagram. My handle is just Janelle Lynn Anderson. And that's I'm on Facebook also. So you can find me over there. But those are some of the best places to reach me. You're, okay. you're going to love Janelle's page. It's so cute with all the cows. Mm-hmm. And everything. I know we'll have, follow her on social. I'll have your le- website linked in the show notes so people can find your website easily. Thank you so much for a super fun conversation. We will be there in a while to visit you and to milk some cows. Absolutely. You guys are open invitation. You can stay with us. You stay yeah. right here. And milking cows. Okay. So you got to wait till at least February, just so you know, because that's when they I can't, again. I can't milk in the cold. No. I'm, a, I'm a very delicate flower. That being said, oh, yes. <laughs> I did. <laughs> come oh in, a- come in April. It'll be warmer. I would love every bit of it. I'm not. I'm even excited. Kidding. You come take over for me. We will make milkmaids out of everybody and anybody who wants to. Yes, we will do it. We will do it. Chicken lady, future milkmaid, future <laughs> cow lady. Thank you, Janelle. You are the best. We'll talk well, to you later. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. We just want to thank Janelle one more time for a really fantastic thought-provoking, and helpful conversation. I just love Janelle. She is so sweet. Go follow her on social media. Just Again, the sight of her with her milk cows is just pure joy. You can tell she really loves those yes. animals. Okay, so are we ready to move on to... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, Holly Ann was experimenting with this dish. Mm-hmm. Now, I have a recipe that I use. Right. Now, you're experimenting because we wanted to add egg in with it and how it would go. And it was pretty good. It is pretty good. We're doing baked macaroni and cheese. And before you jump down our throats, baked macaroni and cheese is a Thanksgiving dish in some areas. It is in my house every year. In this area, a lot of people do baked macaroni and cheese. How can you go wrong with it? It's delicious. I do it every year. And the kids... They beg for it. Yeah. I just went with a really simple rendition. You can add stuff or change the cheese, whatever you want to do. Exactly. But it's easy and virtually foolproof. Okay. So let's go through the ingredients that we're going to use. We're going to use one 12 ounce package of macaroni, two cups of milk, or your dairy free equivalent, one egg. So you're not going to be using a ton, two and a half cups of shredded cheddar cheese, two tablespoons of butter melted or dairy free butter, one tablespoon of Dijon mustard. Pardon me. <laughs> Salt and white pepper to taste. You can use black if you want. I like the white pepper. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 175 degrees Celsius. Lightly grease a two-quart baking dish. You're going to boil the macaroni in a large pot of salted water until it's barely done, about five minutes. For gluten-free pasta, I'd take a little bit longer. Yeah. Drain that and set it aside. In a large mixing bowl, you're going to whisk together the milk and the egg. Then you're going to stir in the cheese, the mustard, and the butter. Take that par-cooked macaroni and pour it into your prepared baking dish. Pour the milk mixture over top. Season with your salt and pepper. Stir it till combined and pop it into the oven, uncovered. You're going to bake it 30 to 40 minutes or until the top is brown. So you don't have to make it into a roux. Because my mac and cheese, mm. I make a roux, and then no. I stir the cheese in, You're and that's letting, the part that takes forever. Exactly. You're letting the addition of the egg sort of make a custard cheesy filling. So, so that takes out the part where you have to right. make a roux. Right. That will cut a lot of time out on your mac and yes, cheese. Yes, exactly. That's for sure. Yep. That's why I went super easy. Because yeah. I make Sophia stir it, and it takes like almost 20 minutes to stir it constantly. Yeah. I mean, I can't guarantee it's going to be a smooth and velvety delicious as the one that you make, but it's going to be pretty darn good. Well, that's good. Yeah. And, you know, serve hot and enjoy. Now, some people like to fancy this up with like some breadcrumbs on the top, things like that. You know, I make it easy. I just take some croutons, put them in a baggie and smush them. Yep. Yeah, that works. Smash them. It gets out my frustration at the same time of putting them on the mac and cheese. I do like whacking things with my rolling pin. (laughs) But yeah, this is super easy, simple, good, delicious. Sounds great. Yeah. So... Try it. You might like it on your Thanksgiving table. Let us know if you do. Are you ready to move on to retail therapy? Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. This week's retail therapy, we're keeping up with the Thanksgiving theme. Now, we're looking at vintage napkin rings. Good times. And they have to be turkey. Do they? Yeah. It's Thanksgiving. I can't use geese or ducks? No. No. 
No, you can. You can use whatever you like. I'm just looking up the turkeys because I don't have any turkey napkin rings. I actually don't either. I think that would be cool to have mm-hmm. for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Now, here's a set of eight vintage from the 70s for $27. That's not terrible. Oh, look at them. They're kind of cool looking. They're like old style ceramic with a, a brown and orange They're glaze. on Poshmark. Now, I never knew Poshmark actually carries the stuff. I thought they oh, were yeah. just clothes and purses. No, you can find anything on Poshmark pretty much. So now you can even find your vintage turkey Thanksgiving napkin rings on Poshmark. That's yes. pretty cool. Yeah. There's lots of different ones. Now, pewter is big for napkin rings. Yeah, pewter's huge. I actually have a whole set of pewter farm animals. I have pewter chickens. I have chickens and ducks. Yeah. yeah. And for some reason, I think those were made a lot in the 70s and the 80s, the pewter. Oh, I think so. I think especially the 80s, yeah. It was also like a big thing. It's like, oh, pewter, like everybody got them. Here's mm-hmm. a set on eBay for twenty nine ninety nine. They're kind of cute. <laughs> they're not dirt cheap. I mean, no. they're, they're a little bit of an investment. So if you're going to pay that price, make sure they're nice and neat. Make sure they're not, you know, chipped up that you're getting your money's worth. Now, when you go to shop napkin rings, this is something that I've learned because I've taken into collecting napkin rings as of late, mm-hmm. as of the last, I don't know, five, 10 years. Uh-huh. Sometimes I get mad because I feel like the rings aren't big enough yes, for I your napkins. That. Yeah. So you got to look at the napkin rings themselves and make sure – I don't know why people do that. They don't make the ring big enough for the napkin to go through. I don't know the answer to that. It is a really good question. Oh, here's a cool set. It's completely non-practical. Now these – I don't think these are vintage, but look at these. That looks like laser cut wood and I love it. It's so cute. I'm going to show you a set of vintage – I can't tell where these were made. Hang on. I'm trying to get – Do you guys – out there have any of the turkey napkin rings oh those are super cute so it's like just a basic wooden napkin ring but um like stylized turkeys have been painted all around and the other thing is those are usually the biggest rings yeah you can usually get your napkin through because i like to do a big cotton napkin i like a proper napkin on my table i like the napkin and i everybody knows that holly and i love to take place setting pictures and there's nothing that looks makes it look more pretty than different kinds of napkins and the napkin rings. But when you can't even fit the napkin through, that's really cute too. You get frustrated. You're oh, like, yeah. come on. I just want to be able to put my napkin out there. They look at the napkins on the plates, but then everybody brings the regular paper napkins in to yeah. use. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yes, that's fine. We'll use them for pictures and then <laughs> the table will look nice and pretty. Oh, I like these. The ceramic. Those green are nice. Ones. They look like they're good size. Yeah. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of glazed ceramic. Yes. A lot of that. A lot of them. Most of them look really nice. The other thing is, there's nice, regular Thanksgiving dressy paper napkins out there oh, that these you are can nice. use. Terracotta. Yeah. They're cute too. And they are $3.75. Oh, that's cute. Here's the gold turkeys. I really like these round, like laser cut ones mm-hmm. that have like the big turkey tail on the back. Yeah. I mean, essentially, if you're if you're looking for these, I've not seen a ton of them in the wild, but you should absolutely look. I have not seen a ton of turkey napkin rings in the wild. Right now, I always get the itch to go to the thrift store like before holidays because I want to get new stuff oh, for I the table. I thought I was the only one. Apparently not. <laughs> you know, well, you and I going to a thrift store is always a fun adventure because we're trying to get we're trying to beat each other to the stuff. It's true. We want the same stuff. That's often, the problem. We often do. It's like, oh, damn, Holly Ann got it first. I'm really liking these plain white ones. Oh, yeah. Although these have red wattle. <laughs> Here's acorns. Oh, that's cute. I like the acorns. Did you see them? Yeah. They were really cute. They are really cute. Okay. Anyway, there's like a ton of these out there for you to find. Check them out if you see them or if you have them. Send us pictures. We want to see it. We're keeping up with our vintage table for Thanksgiving. Make it so pretty that you really and welcoming and just have fun with it and then take some pictures of it and look back and you're going to love it. It's great. If you want to share tablescapes, you know we love them. Yeah. Tag us and let us see what your Thanksgiving tables look like. Definitely. Okay. So should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Yes, we should. Next week, we are spotlighting oh we're doing a color variety next week um the absolutely beautiful double laced silver barnevelder you know barnevelders are one of our all-time faves 
Francesca from Alchemist Farm is joining us to talk rainbow eggs and sustainability. That's a great conversation. Oh, Amy Van Lubin from The Good Egg is joining us for Cracking the Eggs. She's sharing her absolutely delicious and healthy recipe for creme brulee. And it's almost sugar-free. It is. Retail therapy is vintage salt and pepper shakers. We're continuing. And a turkey. Yeah, because we want that Thanksgiving table to look fantabulous. Lots of vintage fun. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.